Today on The State of Us, it now costs $300,000 to raise a child in America. The movement to end homework is wrong, and schools end free meals for millions of students. Welcome to The State of Us. I'm your host, Justin T. Weller, joined today by the one and only the educator extraordinaire of over 35 years and the senior resident historian here at TrueChat, the friendly redneck liberal, lots of titles, Mr. Lance Jackson. Boy, for somebody who doesn't like labels, I got a lot of labels. That's right. Well, that's kind of, I, I don't know if people, oh, and the boomer. Uh, if people haven't picked up on that, that's that's the irony in, in your introduction is I hate labels and he's, he's labeled out the wazoo. Anyway, it now costs $300,000 to raise a child, Lance. Huh. A middle-income family might spend more than $18,000 a year on average as inflation hits food, housing, haircuts, and sports, according to a Brookings analysis. So today we're talking about all things kid, not just the cost of children, but also the movement to end homework and schools ending free meals for millions of students. So we've got a lot to discuss, but we couldn't possibly begin this conversation, Lance, unless, of course, we have a word of the day. Reverberate. Four syllables, R-E-V-E-R-B-E-R-A-T-E. And it can be a transitive verb or an intransitive verb. So you get a little English lesson. We're going to use the definition as an intransitive verb. And it means to have repercussions as an event or action. Repercussions. So what, what what will reverberate as a result of what we're talking about today. Oh, you've got reverberation of what happens to education through the idea of providing or not providing free meals to people. Um, You have the reverberation on society as to people deciding to have or not have children because it costs so much money and the reverberation on education on whether or not you should have homework and what type of homework or no homework, all of that will have an effect on the problem they're trying to solve. So Brookings calculated the cost of raising a family based on a 2017 estimate from the Agriculture Department. The estimate covers a range of expenses that include housing, food, clothing, health care, and child care, and it accounts for childhood milestones and activities diapers, haircuts, sports equipment, and dance lessons, among other things. Ultimately, what this found when they adjusted it for inflation is that the multi-year total to raise a child is up $26,011, or more than 9%, from a calculation based on the inflation rate two years ago, before rapid price increases hit the economy, the Brookings Institution said. It determined that a married middle-income couple with two children would spend $310,605, or an average of $18,271 a year, to raise their younger child born in 2015 through age 17. The calculation uses the factors from an earlier government estimate as the baseline with adjustments for inflation trends. So Lance, you want to have a kid, you can have one for the low, low price of $300,000. Well, I'm just thinking, you know, how much money did the Brookings Institute spend on figuring all this out? (laughs) Because couldn't we, couldn't we have found a better use of money than, than doing this? Um, you know, I. It's expensive. Okay, right? I mean, but whoever said it wasn't. Um, if you're having children or not having children based on what they cost, then you're probably having them or not having them for the wrong reasons. Um, but, you know, I I don't know. You I know, think there are a lot of millennials considering that, though. I think, that's, I think that's fair. And I, I don't know what you're trying to say because you you help me out. You're the numbers guy here. Um, so it costs that to spend it. But if at the age of 22, they start to work, how much money are they worth to society on average if they're, if they're middle of the road? A million and a half, $2 million. So you spend $310,000 and over a 40 year work career, uh, just in money alone, 
you probably make a million, million and a half dollars. To put a dollar sign to children, I'm not sure. I'm not saying it's not valid. I'm not saying they're not right. I'm just saying I'm not sure the point they're selling sees the whole picture. Well, I'm not sure if they're selling a point at all, other than just saying this then, is— Then why do it? Well, because the Brookings Institute, like others, is an analysis-based— I mean, here's, here's a PhD you know. in economics, right? I mean, this is a profound statement. Rising expenses for raising a family could dis- disproportionately affect lower-income families. We had to spend how many thousands of dollars on this study for somebody to say that? Really? You think people who don't have a lot of money are, are being affected disproportionately when the inflation rate is between 7 and 9%? And oh, wait, wait a minute, here's another one that says, huh, poor families have already cut everything they could, so they have nothing else to cut. Having grown up in a poor family, I know that's true. And I don't even have a PhD or work for the Brookings Institute. But that's the whole point. This is this is common sense, right? And I guess, okay, it's nice you put a dollar amount to it. But I, I think, yes, if the more people you have to take care of on the same amount of money, inflation is going to make it difficult. I, the, We're going to make it, I won't say, I, don't, I won't even go so far as to say difficult. It makes it harder, okay? Difficult is one of those words. What's difficult to you maybe isn't difficult to me, right? So I don't think difficult is a fair, a fair word to use. But it will make it harder for you to make ends meet or to have the same things for your family if prices are going up and wages aren't. But when it comes to a human being, it's really hard for me to put a dollar amount to them. They're not saying this is the value of them. They're saying this is what it costs to get them from birth through age 17. You will need to spend about this much money. Is it right? But I'm thinking about why I had children and I, and I, I you know, they're 34 and 30 now and they're still very important to my life and everything. But I think what I learned, you know, it was, well, was it the societal pressure? Was it, you know, um, I wanted to have children. Why? Because I wanted children around. I like young people. I, you know, I have, it's, it's fun for me. Right. But it's what, what has it taught me? It's taught me that love can be, can expand exponentially that you just don't, how do I get more love? Well, have children, you have more love, but it's also taught me a sense of sacrifice because I made, I have as a parent tried to make sure that they had things before I had things. And if you don't have children, I'm not saying you can't learn that. I'm just saying anecdotally in my life, the biggest thing I got out of having children was I learned to give of myself for someone else. It wasn't all about me anymore. It was about somebody else. And I think part of the issue when we talk about this is that it's that notion of, because we like to do that, right? As people, it's the the one size fits all. There are obviously millions of, of wonderful parents across the United States of all different income levels, right? Who love their children, who sacrifice for them, who put their needs first, and it makes them better people, right? It, it makes them into better members of society. And that's a wonderful benefit of having children. There are also, and Lance and I are very familiar w- with this because of the ones that we work with, people who have children for the wrong reasons and people who do not sacrifice for their children or what they think they're doing that is sacrificing isn't really sacrificing. And I don't want people to read into that and say that's just poor people because I, you know. Oh, no, no, I, no. I, 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 I have... I went to school uh, when I, when I went to school in Urbana, Ohio, at a public school, right in in a relatively poor rural county, and then went to a private <laughs> uh, Catholic school where I, where for it college. was where it was unusual. I mean, I was I was very weird for having gone to public school. That was very strange, right. you know, because because I, I mean, ninety percent of everybody that I knew was private school, 
you know, and some of the things that, you know, so the point being the there issues is, they had and the things they dealt with. Yeah. They weren't in a lot of ways, they weren't as well off as the poor public school kids that you went to school. With. Right. So I got the point there is I don't want to, I'm not, I'm not people read into that. I don't want people to, who are listening to be like, Oh, well, you're saying that, you know, poor people shouldn't have children. No, that's not at all what I'm saying. I think there's plenty of wealthy people who shouldn't have children either. You know, I met lots of people from all manner of backgrounds who are probably, if I had a child, I would not want them to raise my child. You know, I would not be comfortable with them being the person <laughs> to influence uh, the next generation of humans. And that's okay. Cause I think part of the message is raising children isn't for everybody, but that's one of those things where as a society, and that's what we kind of have to think about as we're thinking about some of these other things like homework and, and free meals. It's hard because we're in a world where we keep, we, we have this notion that we have to keep growing the population. And I think we've started to face a reality as a race that maybe we don't need the population to keep growing, maybe holding steady or even reducing some would be okay. So that pressure, I think that some people feel to have children or who think, you know, my life's bad, so I'm going to have a child because that'll make it better. I mean, yes, might your life be better. But again, I think it's that it's back to your thing, Lance, of it, why are you doing it? So why is having the numbers valuable? One reason might be if people understand the total cost, maybe some of those people that have children for the wrong reasons may opt to say, yeah, I'm not sure that I want a child that bad. Is it worth $18,000 a year to me? And if the answer is that you don't know, then, you know, maybe you should wait. <laughs> that's put, all put I'm hold, saying. Put a hold on that's, your plans. That's yeah. all I'm saying is that maybe, you know, and if at some point you're like, yeah, you know, I really want a child and, and, and I don't care what it costs. Okay, well, great. You know, then, then maybe you're in the right spot to get started. There's a lot of other consequences to that, you know, of, of the cost. And I think it's, it's too bad that it's near a four decade high, right, to raise children. That's unfortunate, but at the same time, it gives us that opportunity to do what we're doing, which is evaluate why do we have children and how do we want to take care of them? And that's part of what we're going to talk about uh, coming up next. Should we end homework? And schools are ending free meals for millions of students. Keep it here on The State of Us. We'll be right back. When we saw this article, we knew that we had to bring in our senior resident historian and give him as many labels as possible in this show because uh, he probably could have written it himself. I don't know if you know Jay Caspin Kang, but uh, I, I do think, not. I th- it's, it's Lance's uh, pen name. Okay. Because the article is entitled, The Movement to End Homework is Wrong. And it is an opinion piece from the New York Times. By the way, I, I don't know if I mentioned it, but in the first segment, we were referencing the Wall Street Journal article, news article, um, about the cost to, to raise a child. What so, he does, though, in the, in the article, you're going to think, oh, he's just bashing ending homework. He really doesn't. That's why, you know, he, he gives some credence to the side that is arguing that we need to give up homework. He said, there are some points here that are valid. Now... He thinks some of them are misplaced. He thinks some of them are misleading. And he thinks some of them are probably right. But in the end, then he explains why he thinks even though all of that could be true, and he gives, like I said, some value to the people who are talking about ending homework, he gives his reasons as to why he thinks it's necessary. And even agrees. He goes so far as the one point, he says, I agree that a student's back to what you said in the first segment, that a student's socioeconomic status will likely be a better predictor of how they do on their homework than their personal traits. So yeah, okay, they have a point. He said, that's probably true. Well, just like we've talked about, socioeconomic status is a better indicator of your overall health throughout your life than your vital signs. Right. Which is just, I mean, again, it's mind boggling when you think about that. And you say, well, what? how could a student's socioeconomic be the thing that, but the point is that their, their paper contends that he's agreeing with it and saying, yeah, you know, I mean, what the data tells us is that 
if we use your socioeconomic status when you're born, and we use that as a predictor of where you're going to get to in life, that that is a more accurate predictor than your personal behavioral traits when you're in school. Well, and he goes, and he agrees with them as well. He says, the evidence about the effectiveness of homework in learning is pretty scattered. There are some that says it helps, some that say don't. And he said, overall, I would have to say the fairest assessment is that the benefits of homework are pretty inconclusive because of the difficulties in isolating one part of the student's academic life and drawing huge conclusions about how it affects everything else. So then why does he say then that we should have homework? He said, because kids need to learn how to practice things. They need to practice practice. I can't think of one thing that matters more than the simple satisfaction of mastering something that you once were bad at. So see, his argument for homework isn't that, oh, we're going to make better kids. We're going to make smarter kids. We're going to do this. He goes, no, it comes down to all of us feel better about ourselves and are willing to take on another challenge once we have completed a challenge that we think we never could get. And homework can be that. Because we know too, like Justin said in the first segment, you know, um, when you go away to college, a lot of the kids you run into are going to private school. So to compare that those people with other people, you know, is the amount of homework the reason that those kids are doing well? You know, or is it because their parents are more involved in their life? Blah, blah, blah. You know, all of that argument there. But he says, don't we all just feel better when we work hard at something and we accomplish it? Doesn't that set us up for future success? And in that way, homework is good. Okay. And he doesn't argue here and talk about, you know, the number of problems or whatever, because it's basically a math, math article. But you know, if you're practicing addition and subtraction, do you need a hundred questions or can you get just as much out of 20 questions? You know, and there, there is all that, but his point is just very simple. Children learning that they have the ability to master something that once they could, at one time they couldn't do is a beneficial skill for the rest of their life. Not that the research is invaluable, because I think part of what it's trying to point out is what is the strictly academic value of homework? The answer is it's inconclusive, right? At best, we're not 100% sure. And why? Well, one of the big reasons, we talk about this all the time, right? It's the correlation causation thing. Well, they did homework, and then two weeks later, their test scores improved. So the homework made their test scores improve. Well, we don't know that for sure, you know, because what else were they doing? Oh, well, they were in they were in this study group and they came in at lunch and they worked with the teacher and the teacher did these two lessons that were different than these other ones. So was or it their, the, or, or their parents said you're grounded and you don't get the car. I'm going to take your device away yeah, from I mean, you. You don't know that homework was so, the motivation or the sole motivation right. for success. And if you ask the student, I mean, how how are they supposed to pin that down? And I think the point there is the reason that we don't have good conclusive evidence is the only way to get good conclusive evidence would be to take children, remove all external factors, you know, and say, okay, you're going to sit in the same class as all these other people sit in. You're not going to do anything else other than that. And there's no motivation or anything, but you, this group's going to do homework and this group's not, and then we're going to measure it. And of course you can't do that because these are, you know, children and you're not going to, I mean, lots of reasons why we can't do the thing that would tell us conclusively. Well, the problem is it, as he points out, there are teachers out there who think school exists in a fishbowl, and it doesn't, right? We, 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 we know that all students and teachers bring to the education process their own strengths and weaknesses. And if you understand that, I think that's the key to having a successful school because the students alone aren't at fault and the teachers alone aren't at fault and the parents alone aren't at fault. It's a combination. So we have to all learn to work together, but we don't do that because we spend time pointing fingers at each other. Hence to your point, we really don't know what brought about the change or the success. And and that's not to say and I think that's the, what the author's point is, that's not to say that there's not value in it because the 
the other paper that, you know, this author is responding to the, the baby in the bathwater thing, I think is apt in that it's suggesting, well, because we can't conclusively prove that it's helpful and because we know that, you know, it makes it, it, it demonstrates or it, it calls out, uh, the inadequacies between people of different socioeconomic backgrounds, then we shouldn't do it. And it's almost like, it, it is that it's like we're treating a symptom, right? And not the cause. So the issue is that we're judging people based on, you know, how they do on homework. So then we're not going to do homework. Well, isn't the issue that we're, that we're making assumption and judgments. I mean, it's not the homework's fault, right? right? We're the ones that are taking that and turning it into something that's evil, you know? And, and also just, I mean, isn't it good to have, a barometer on how students are doing. I mean, the other thing that comes, I think part of what this guy points out is as a teacher, part of the confusion comes in on how am I supposed to help students if I don't really have a great understanding of where we're at? And if I never do homework and the only thing I ever do is test, then that's the only barometer and that's the thing that's counting toward their grades. And now, I mean, it opens up this practicality component of, yeah, maybe there's another solution, but you're talking about a serious change to how we're going to try to assess how students are doing, um, not to be evil and to separate them, but to say, okay, well, this student's struggling, so I need to give them more help or we need to get them more help. And I think there's that unintended potential consequence too of if you just eliminate homework altogether, you are removing a tool that Good teachers may be using to say, hmm, you know, just like if they've developed a relationship with the student, the question may not be, do you do you not understand the material? It might be, is there something else going on? And again, it's maybe there is a better tool. So I'm not saying I'm opposed to exploring what that is, but I don't think the notion of the contention that well, we're just going to wipe out this tool and we have no plan to to replace it. Are there teachers who assign an unnecessary amount of homework? Absolutely. You know, of course, of course there are. Um, and I think that was the point that was made that's so important about this is, should we end homework? No. Should we end senseless homework? Sure. And should we balance it to make it valuable for students? Yes. But there is a value, whether or not it improves the great outcomes specifically, there is a value to teaching people how to practice. Practicing how you practice is relevant because you have to do that at some point. Um, otherwise you never have the stamina to practice anything. And I think we've done a show here recently on attention spans where we talked some about that, um, and the medication of students and children nowadays and, and all of that, right. Is part of this bigger conversation about, do we really want to do things that are tools that help us build attention versus, I mean, do we really want to get rid of those? Maybe, but again, I wouldn't be in favor of getting rid of it unless we're ready to say, here's the thing that we're going to do that's better. Because to just say, ah, just don't do it. You know, it's like, well, <laughs> we already got a lot of problems with, uh, you know, the way things are. And so I'm not sure that just eliminating it's an answer. But let's talk about uh, schools ending free meals for millions of students. And by the way, that headline may kind of be a misnomer. I'm not sure that blaming the schools for it is exactly fair. <laughs> um because the, the money is drying up, but we're going to talk about that. Keep it here on The State of Us. We'll be right back. The U.S. Department of Agriculture, Food, and Nutrition Services suspended eligibility requirements for free and reduced price meal applications and gave every student a free breakfast and lunch regardless of family income that started in 2020 as a result of the pandemic. So for, you know, two years, people have grown sort of accustomed to this idea of kids go to school and they get, and again, I'm not sure that free is really the word we should use, you do not have to send them with money. They get a no cost to them. Right. Because uh, it's not, again, there's money involved, right? It's tax dollars involved. Yeah. Right. Uh, by the way, to the tune of $26.8 billion. Uh, so if you have that laying around in your couch, then I guess, you know, we can say that it's free or chump change, but it's a lot of money, right? I mean, it, it's not, it's not free. 
um, free, no cost to you when you're going through and getting the food, but it is a cost to us as a society. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. I'm just saying, let's be clear about what it is. So millions of school children have gone back to school this fall and they're back in class and free breakfast and or possibly free lunch, not available. Um, yeah, the, the program that was in before the pandemic is still there. Correct. So if you come from if you qualify, a family of need based on, you know, the education department's um, grid, you know, how many people in the family, how much money, how much income, you can still qualify for that. That part of the program still exists. But what there was, I think the best way to describe it for me is there was a universal free breakfast and free lunch, meaning the food was prepared and anybody could go through line and eat it and you didn't have to fill out any paperwork. And that is now gone. The universal program, the money has dried up from the government and it has ceased to exist. Um, but what's interesting is there are some school districts who have decided to keep it because they saw the benefits of it. And therein lies my conundrum, right? Because I'm the old boomer, old white man who says, by God, you should pay for what you get. And, you know, you need to do that. But at the same time, the educator in me, I will tell you straight up, folks, after 35 years, if there's a student, and I think adults are the same way, but having worked with young people, if there's a young person in my classroom who is hungry, they are not learning at the best level they can learn. It's just, it's a, it's a matter of fact, all right? It just is. And I can't, you know, there are millions of teachers out there, thank you to all of you, who keep snacks in their desk. And they may keep, you know, apples, or they might keep uh, a piece of string cheese, or they might keep uh, peanut butter crackers or something like that in their desk. And when they walk by and students are taking a test and they hear somebody's stomach growl, or they see that little Johnny and Susie aren't concentrating like they know, did you eat breakfast this morning? No, we didn't. There's nothing in the house, right? I didn't have time. We go to our desk and just quietly without drawing attention to them, put a couple of crackers or something on their desk so that they can eat because we know we're not getting their best efforts, okay? And it's the same thing if you're an adult and you go to work, right? If you're thinking about how hungry you are and you're thinking about your next meal or when you're going to get to eat next or when that might be, you're probably not concentrating as well as you could on the work at hand. So, this is the real conundrum. On one hand, I'm like, yeah, well, you know, you got it was universal free for a while, but hey, by God, we're not a communist country here in the United States. You know, um, we are socialists, but you know, we're not communism. We're not going to give everybody what they want for free. By God, you got to work to earn something. Rah, 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 you know, there's that side of me. And then there's the other side that's like, yeah, you know, but kids can't learn if you don't feed them. And dang on it, if you're hurting kids, that's wrong. Justin, what do I do? <laughs> I mean, seriously, this uh, article is yeah. not that long, folks. And I spent no, it's an, very brief. I spent an entire afternoon after I read it thinking, God, he's going to pick this one for a show. And I said, I don't know where I'm going to come down on it. And that was a week or so ago. And I still, I, I'm still internally having this argument with myself. All right. It's reverberated within my soul for over a week now that I knew we were going to talk about this. Because I want to say, well, doggone it, you know, you need to get a job and you need to be able to take care of your kids. And so you need to pay for lunch. But on the other hand, you look at the cost of a battleship or a fighter jet versus putting food in the belly of a young person. I'd rather my tax dollars go into the belly of a young person than another battleship or another fighter jet. Even though we just did an episode about how we got to get ready for a war with China and Taiwan. I don't <laughs> – man, the world is a, is a really horrible place to try to figure things out. Any number of actions you take can reverberate Are people understanding a wide range. all the voices that go off in my head during the show? <laughs> I don't know. You, you know, but I mean, they're, they're, you just heard from three well, different I, voices. I know they're there. I'm not sure that I understand them. You just them, heard but from I, three I different that, <laughs> voices in my head. Right there, I know that they live in there. Um, no, I, I'm very sympathetic to it because the other thing, you know, reminding, we alluded to it earlier, but for folks that don't remember, Lance and I work at 
a youth center here locally, um, among other things. And it really is, it's such a, I wish there are people who feel so strongly on on both sides of this question, because it's a larger question about um, how do you address poverty, right? Um, And we did this this show, the two-part thing on homelessness. Um, and, And maybe that's part of what I guess when somebody's drowning, right? Um, you don't stand at the side of the pool and say, you know, well, you should get swim lessons. Uh, you jump in and save them is hopefully what you do. I mean, I suppose you could stand there and say that, but I don't know if that'd do much good, which I think is kind of the point. Um, however, however, boiling it down to make it that simple is complicated as well. Because we know from students we've worked with, it's not that they're evil. It's not that their parents are bad. It's that if what you have right now is better than anything you've ever had. It can be very difficult to then decide that you need to strive for more. And so the what the conundrum that we're getting to there is, do children need to eat? Yes. If you give them food for free and they grow up that way, then that's all they've ever known and this whole notion of, well, why would I want to go do something that makes me pay for food? And that's not evil or wrong. I mean, it, in many ways, it's a basic logic thing. Okay, well, I've never had to pay for it before. And now you're telling me that if I do X, Y, Z, now I'm going to have to pay for it. So why would I do X, Y, Z? I get good food. I eat. I, I'm not hungry. You know, so I why why would I do these things if doing those things means that now I have to work harder to get this thing. And, and I'm not saying it works that way, right? Why, because why, why work for something if you're going to get it free? It, you, and and, and that's, I mean, that's, that's what you're saying. Well, and, and, and how do you convince somebody to go to work if you can get it for free? And that's the, that's the challenge. And you and of, I know, because there's something else out there that a, a bet, a, a, a healthier life and those kinds of things are available if you have the money. But if all you're worried about is stopping the pang in your belly, then you can get food for free. And I know, and that's part of why it's controversial, this whole notion of, because you don't, you don't want to inadvertently teach people that everything's free, right? You don't want to do it because it's not, at least not in the society we have right now. You know, it costs money. It costs somebody money. um, And it costs us as a nation debt, you know? And and so the point being that no, we don't want children to go hungry. At the same time, I think there's, there. it seems like there's got to be something better, Lance, than what we've got right now, which is just this notion that we're either going to provide it universally free or you have to fill out these really complicated forms, you know, if you can get your parents to fill these out. Because, I mean, remember, this doesn't account for the ones that, you know, uh, you can't get the parents to fill it out, so you're not getting free lunch. Um, well, right, and then there's the stigma. Yes. You know, that the, right there, I, I yeah. don't want to turn, hey, uh, this is my, and I had this happen. They would walk up to me and turn in their homework and then underneath would be papers and I'd start to pull it out and they go, that's my free lunch papers. Yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. No problem. I'll, I'll, you know, and I make sure because there, there was a stigma. Sure. Uh, attached to that, like, oh, wow, you don't have money, you know. Yeah. And, and you don't and want you that, pay for you don't lunch. want that for young people either. But I think herein, herein is what needs to be done. And, and I know that there are teachers at schools that do it. And I know we have people at the youth center who do it. And we try to explain to the kids, okay, this food doesn't cost you any money, but it's costing money. And they look at you, huh? Like you always say, Justin, you can't get mad at somebody for not knowing something that they've never been taught. And so you use that opportunity, right, to to teach or like at the youth center, we have kids serve the meal. We have kids clean up after the meal. We're teaching them that there are things that you do in order to get this and that there are others who are in their heart providing for you for this as a way for you to do well in your studies so you can go on to bigger and better things. And as you say, they're like, well, what would that be? And so we show them you know, we take them places, we do things with them and teachers and schools do that too. Doing it by itself is not good, but when it can be used as a tool to progress society, right? That's, that's what we want to do. And that's where I think therein lies 
what's positive with it, right? Something that's better because that's what you ask for. That's my better is that you don't not provide it, but you teach as you're providing it. Everything that happens at school. The old biblical saying, right? Better to teach a man to fish than to give him a fish. To give him a fish. And that's that's exactly where I was going with. I think you want to offer universal you know, meals to everybody in school and we want to take that expense on as taxpayers. Well, let's look at also how we could defray that cost and make it a learning opportunity. There are lots of learning opportunities missed at schools today. And I think lunch is one of those times. Shouldn't the students, I mean, we, this is what we do at the youth center. Should, shouldn't they help prepare the meal? Shouldn't they help serve? I mean, if it's universal for everybody, you're not singling out the people that can't afford it because everybody helps you know, you you take turns helping prepare the meal, helping serve the meal, helping clean up after the meal, helping clean up the room the meal took place in. To me, that seems like now you've got me interested in doing it because we're teaching that there is a cost, right? Now, did you have to hand somebody a dollar? No. But did you have to give something up to get something? Yes, you did. And I think that's more about what we need to be, you know, it's not so much, did we get our $2.75 from that kid? I, you know, I don't know if that's what we need to be focused on as much as if we need to be focused on, did we teach the students that there are costs to get things? And, you know, not preaching like child labor here or anything, but obviously if all these kids are helping do these things, then doesn't that reduce overhead in some areas for schools on other items? I mean, yes, people still have to teach them. Like, you can't just let them go on this. But you don't need as many kitchen staff. You don't have to pay the janitors as long because there's not as much to clean. I mean, you know, you teach kids when when they're young how to do some of these things. Valuable life skills in addition to defraying costs for schools, which helps offset some of the additional expense of providing the food. I I'm sure that there's smarter people than Lance and I who could, you seems know. Seems like a win-win to me, though. Who could come up with something there that that would work, but it seems that seems like something we should look into. Why do we have this conversation today, Lance? Well, because here at True Chat, we have a mission, and our mission is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. And we've done that today, all right? We've, we've shared with you some things that we feel very strongly about, and we've shared with you some things that... Yeah, we don't have the answer. Maybe you do. Let us know. Send us a message. Email us at the po- at podcast at the state of us dot org, and tell your family and friends. And if they like it, and they said, "What well, sounds like a show I would like," tell them as a podcast they can find us on Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcast, and everywhere podcasts are found. The State of Us is available Tuesdays and Thursdays, released first thing in the morning as a podcast. We're also heard on the weekends. Those same episodes, AM and FM radio stations across the country. Who takes the win today, Lance, for reverberate? I think it's reverberating from shore to shore that I won today. (laughs) Well, as always, we'll leave it up to the ultimate judge. For the State of Us, I'm Justin T. Weller. I'm Lance Jackson. Special thanks to producer, the ultimate judge, Bradley Bush. Thank you all, our audience, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be the champ. Be sure to check out our website, thestateofus.org, for books, articles, and all the ways to tune in. Thestateofus.org.